Dangerous new superbugs are emerging all across the globe, which cannot be killed by the vast majority of modern antibiotics. How can scientists tell the difference between normal bacterial flora found all over the human body and deadly superbugs that cause untreatable infections? We will cover three key points on this topic. How antibiotic resistance is measured, examples of resistance in clinically relevant microbes, and MIC and MBC for antibiotics. When it comes to measuring antibiotic resistance, standardization is the key. The same protocols must be used across the globe so resistance can be reliably detected over and over again. Having first isolated the microbe on an agar plate, we suspend two to three bacterial colonies in sterile saline to prepare a solution referred to as a McFarland standard. We vortex the McFarland standard and measure its cloudiness or turbidity to make sure that it is the same for all bacteria being tested. Again, this allows us to standardize the process. The McFarland standard is then used to spread the bacteria as an even lawn across the entire surface of an agar plate. To maximize coverage, we turn the plate at different angles while repeatedly spreading the bacteria across its entire surface. Antibiotics can come in different formulations. Tablets, drops, creams, or liquid suspensions are all quite common. For this type of testing, we can use antibiotic disc dispensers to add many different antibiotics all at once to our testing plate. Simply place the dispenser over the plate and press down gently. Don't press down too hard. We only want the individual disc to touch the plate, not the edge of the dispenser itself. When we're done, you can see the discs neatly pressed onto the plate in a circular conformation. Each disc is a different antibiotic, pre-calibrated at the right concentration for resistance testing. After incubating the plate at 37 degrees Celsius overnight, the bacteria will glow on the plate around the antibiotic discs. Where the antibiotic diffuses from the disc into the surrounding agar, there will be a small round patch where the bacteria did not grow. We call this the zone of inhibition, and the diameter of this circular region is what we use to measure resistance to the drug. If the diameter of the zone of inhibition is bigger than a certain size, the antibiotic is effectively stopping bacterial growth. If the zone is smaller than the cutoff, this demonstrates that the bacteria is resistant to the antibiotic and can still grow and replicate in its presence. How are these size cutoffs determined? The zone of inhibition measurements are updated regularly through standardized international testing processes. You will notice that the cutoffs for antibiotic resistance are different for different bacteria. There is a lot of work that goes into generating these guidelines. Let's look at the zone of inhibition results for some clinically significant bacteria. Beginning with Staphylococcus aureus, we can compare the results for a strain that is sensitive to most antibiotics versus a multi-drug resistance strain that can be detected in healthcare settings. If a patient is infected with a resistance strain, doctors will simply have fewer options to treat that infection. We can look at the zone of inhibition for the same antibiotics across different bacteria. E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, each of these are clinically significant bacteria and their zones of inhibition look different. Keep in mind the cutoffs are different for different bacteria and that needs to be factored into the testing. We can also look at the same results for Candida albicans, which is a fungal species, so none of these antibacterial drugs should work. Let's come back to Staph aureus. If we measure the diameter of the zones of inhibition in millimeters, here are the readings for each antibiotic for the sensitive and resistant strains. Using the cutoffs on screen, can you figure out which antibiotics these two strains of Staph aureus are sensitive or resistant to? I'll give you a moment to work through the values. Let's come back now and walk through the solutions. What you see on screen now are the antibiotics that the two strains of Staph aureus are resistant to. The remaining antibiotics should be effective in treating these infections, but note that there are fewer options that will work for the resistant strain as compared to the sensitive strain. So far, all of the zones of inhibition were determined using a specific concentration of each antibiotic for different bacteria. In clinical settings, the doctor will want to prescribe the lowest concentration of antibiotics that will still stop the infection while minimizing potential side effects for the patient. This is where MIC, minimum inhibitory concentration, and MBC, minimum bactericidal concentration, come into play. In antibiotics MIC is the lowest concentration that will inhibit bacterial growth. We measure this by performing serial dilutions of the antibiotic and adding them to the same concentration of bacterial cells. Amongst the tubes with no visible turbidity, the one with the lowest concentration of antibiotic added is what we're looking for. This concentration is the antibiotics MIC for this bacterial strain. Antibiotics may inhibit bacterial growth without killing them. The infection may reappear after the course of antibiotics is finished. MBC represents the lowest antibiotic concentration that will kill bacterial cells, not just inhibit 
inhibit their growth. Clinicians consider both MIC and MBC for determining the optimal amount of antibiotics to prescribe, especially for serious infections. We measure MBC by serially diluting the antibiotic as before and adding them to bacterial cultures. Of the tubes with no visible turbidity, the broth culture is subcultured onto agar plates. The lowest concentration that allowed less than 0.1% of the original bacterial sample to survive is the MBC. We can assess this by counting the colonies on all the plates. If an antibody kills bacterial cells, its MIC will be close to its MBC. When we see no turbidity with bactericidal antibiotics, it is because the bacterial cells are all already dead. If an antibody is just inhibiting bacterial growth, its MBC will be much higher than its MIC. The absence of turbidity is due to a lower number of bacterial cells, which of course can still grow when subcultured onto agar plates. The remaining bacterial cells can still be killed, but it requires a much higher dosage. Hence an MBC that is higher than its MIC. To recap, we discussed the disk diffusion method of measuring zones of inhibition, examined clinical bacterial strains commonly associated with emerging antibiotic resistance, and outlined the importance of MIC and MBC. These principles govern the detection and treatment of superbugs, which affects us all.